It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us to the things we know. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. Now this is Paul's letter to the Galatians. I got a letter yesterday from Oakwood Baptist Ministries. Dear neighbor, do you find that you're busy getting things done but not always the right things? When you think of church, your first thought is probably, how in the world could I find time for that? I'm way too busy. If you're way too busy for Sunday, there's something wrong. (laughs) The fact is, when God in his proper place, when God has his proper place in your life, he helps everything else come together the right way. If they knew what they were talking about, they would know that that's correct. At Oakwood, you'll find helpful ministry every week every week for everyone in your family from the nursery to the children and the teenagers to the adults everyone can find a place of fun friendship personal growth and spiritual strength our church is full of tremendous opportunities this is a letter to me of course and everybody in the neighborhood probably for kids We have fun classes, games, treats, and crafts for teens, the right kind of friendships, mentoring, public school Bible studies. I don't know what that is. Public school Bible studies? I don't think so. You're a private organization. Annual trips and fun events for for adults, singles ministries, couples classes, retreats, Friendships with people who really care. Softball, basketball, and soccer. For seniors, a caring church family. Monthly activities for building strong friendships. Classes with Bible teaching. Annual trips with friends. SALT. And SALT stands for seniors, adults, laboring together. If anything seniors should be doing, it's not laboring senior adults laboring together and that's bi-weekly and then it said something else about the fact that uh, well let's see let me find it I knew I found it somewhere it said something about you'll get a message that lasts all week well that's what it says I can't find it right now all week one message all week 20 minute message all week that's phenomenal so I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to come and see what we are about on Friend Day. Friend Day, Sunday, June 25th. Please take time to view the enclosed DVD. I probably will just for some laughs. And listen to the CD of Oakwood Music. If it's good, I'll listen. Feel free to call us if we can answer any of your questions regarding the ministry of Oakwood. So if you don't like it here, head over to Oakwood. Lots of fun things to do, obviously. And uh, I want you I want you to see how many uh, pastors they have as well that one thing my father's noticed going around Anderson there's a church on every corner little churches on every corner you can just look over there's a church there's a church you know why he told me this and I agree with it they all break away from the big mega church they all get dissatisfied with all this fun and games and go have fun and games at their little church that's all they do And Anderson has more churches than any place in the world that I've ever been. Why? They break away from each other. Split it up. And the reason why? They don't understand there's one pastor uh, pastor teacher per one congregation. They have Brent D. Armstrong, senior pastor. Paul E. Brown, administrative pastor. Victor Irving, assistant pastor. Youth assistant pastor. Mike Davis, assistant pastor. Outreach assistant pastor. Uh, and then Darren Rood, assistant pastor. 
then he's with salt, shut-ins, whatever that is. Then they have a staff evangelist. Then they have a Spanish pastor. All these pastors for one church. Of course, God ordained one pastor teacher per one local church. We'll study that at some point. And so this is why churches split apart. And what are they doing? All these people go for fun. Obviously, that's the whole point of the church. Even if this church grows, we're never going to have any of that junk. And if you think we are, you're in the wrong place. Never. I won't allow it. I will not allow any of this uh, nonsense. Programs here and programs there will not allow assistant pastors, senior assistant pastor, administrative pastors, youth pastors, all of that junk. There's one pastor teacher for one church. And that's why Christianity has so much problems, and that's why the unbelieving world makes fun of Christianity. I'd make fun of it too. In fact, I do. Because uh, most of it has nothing to do with the Word of God. Come here for a country club. Play some basketball, play some soccer. What's that got to do with the Christian way of life? You say, but it's fellowship. It's not Christian fellowship. It's friendship. It's human fellowship. And unbelievers have human fellowship. And you say, but it's fellowship among Christians. It's just a big distraction is all it is. And we note that because I got the letter from the Baptist. If I were to get a letter from Paul, would it say in Galatians 1.1, I, Paul, come to you with a basketball game. By the way, we beat the Ephesians. The Galatians beat the Ephesians. Let's see us beat the West Side Ephesians next time. And let's have a grand old time. Oh, let's have some soccer games. As some of our young people like soccer. Let's go play soccer against the uh, Judaizers. The Judaizers are legalists. Let's show those Judaizers how us grace players really play. That's not Paul's message. That's not Paul's letter. Paul's letters to his congregation is filled with doctrine. And that's what churches are designed for by God. Doctrine. Not fun and games. Doctrine. Now, if you love doctrine, it's fun. If you don't, it's irritating. And if you don't like doctrine, you need to go with the fun and games crowd. So Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. Christ. Now you have to know Greek to understand the emphatic position here. It means Christ and only Christ. It's emphatic. Christ and only Christ redeemed and this redemption means at a point of time that goes on forever. Active voice means you can do nothing about it. Christ did it all. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written. It is written in the past with the result that it stands written forever. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. This is quoted from Deuteronomy 21:23. And there's something we must note about that. In Deuteronomy 21, 23, there was no crucifixion. If you were to be executed, they didn't crucify you. They didn't even have a system of crucifixion. In Deuteronomy 21, 23, the means of execution was stoning. They would stone you to death. So this is prophetic. They didn't even have this form of execution. It was written at a time when the death penalty was by stoning only and there was no crucifixion. So this is prophetic to the fact that Jesus Christ would hang on the tree. And cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And that means that Jesus Christ became a curse for us as a substitute for us. Now the Galatians have made the worst possible mistake in leaving grace where they had blessing and now they've moved to the law where there's nothing but cursing. And we've noted how the law has nothing but cursing related to it, but grace has blessing related to it. So the word redeemed here means to be purchased from the slave market. Just as Hosea purchased his unfaithful wife from the slave market, so Christ has pur purchased our unfaithful selves out from the slave market of sin. We've been purchased and we are not faithful. We cannot be. No one has ever kept the law perfectly. Therefore, we're all under the curse of the law. Therefore, we need to be redeemed. We are born inside the slave market of sin. And yet, these Galatians have decided they're going to work themselves out of the slave market, but they're already purchased. And the more you work, the deeper in slavery you go. The only way to have eternal life and freedom 
is, cro is the cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you, and no member of the human race has ever worked for salvation and received it. Christ has once and for all redeemed us, is what the passage says. And this, is, this includes Paul, and it also includes the Galatian believers. Yet they're going in for the law now. They've been seduced, hypnotized. Galatians 3.14 He redeemed us in order that. This introduces in the Greek a purpose clause. He redeemed us in order that. There's a purpose behind it. The blessing given to Abraham might come. Might come in the Greek is at a point of time once and for all. He redeemed us in order that, introduces a purpose clause, for the purpose of blessing given to Abraham that might come to us, the Gentiles, at a point of time once and for all. Then we have dative of advantage, for the benefit of us in Christ Jesus, so that we might once and for all receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit here is in the Greek, it's in the subjunctive mood. And in the subjunctive mood, that means that it must come from their volition. You see what happened with the translators is they're just going to translate word for word. But the Greek is a very in-depth language. And we have dative of advantage. We have purpose clause. We have dative of your benefit. We have the subjunctive mood. And all of these things have to be taken into account when translating a verse in order to understand its full meaning. And when you learn any language, you will note you can't translate it word for word. Some of you may be learning Spanish in high school. If not, you may decide to do so. And since so many people in this country speak Spanish now, it might be a wise move. Who knows? Probably get a better job. And when you learn Spanish, you'll learn that the uh, why, you can translate word for word, but it still won't make any sense. Well, they even use different word orders, especially when you get deep into Spanish, you'll begin to see these things. And there's no way you can translate from any language word for word, not even German, and German is closely related to English, but you can't translate it word for word and have it make sense to anyone who doesn't understand German. And you can't make Greek make sense unless they understand Greek, so this is how it goes. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come at a point of time once and for all to the Gentiles for their benefit, native of advantage, in Christ Jesus, so that we might once and for all receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Faith. And again, the subjunctive mood means that it comes from the source of your volition. No one can force you to believe in Christ. You can't force anyone to believe in Christ. And you know what churches have done? Well, they started out and they said, you know, you need to believe in Christ. But then they said, well, you know, maybe we need to beg people. Everyone with a mother come forward. Just walk forward. And uh, therefore, by doing that, uh, they have almost forced the issue. But you don't force the issue. If they don't believe, they don't believe. It's their choice. And if God, the Holy Spirit, hasn't revealed the gospel to them, it's their fault. So what do you do? You make the issue clear and let God, the Holy Spirit, work it out. Don't try to work it out for him. You can. So the reason why Jesus Christ had to be made for a curse as a curse for us is so that we can have the blessing of Abraham, as noted in Galatians 3.14. What is the blessing of Abraham? Faith alone in Christ alone. What's the covenant of Abraham? Faith alone in Christ alone. So what we must note now is Christ in the Old Testament. Some of, some of you might not understand Christ in the Old Testament. He was revealed in the Old Testament. Salvation is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Many people don't understand that, but it's a, a very basic doctrine. Salvation was the same in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there was a different revelation, however, a different means of revelation. And we have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, just to note Christ in the Old Testament for a moment, Jesus Christ walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ revealed himself to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. We've noted that before. In the cool of the evening, Jesus Christ would give them a message every night, even Saturday night. They might have to want to go out and play with the animals, but Christ would come in the cool of the evening every night, Monday through Sunday. 
So the Lord Jesus Christ walked with Adam in the garden. Jesus Christ was constantly manifested to man, therefore. Jesus Christ also appeared in the burning bush to Moses. He visited Abraham as a man in Abraham's tent. <clears throat> Jesus Christ personally visited Abraham. Jesus Christ personally wrestled with Jacob. How many of you young men like to wrestle? How would you like the chance to wrestle with Jesus Christ? Jacob got that chance, and Jacob got his rib broke. So he appeared in a burning bush. He appeared to Abraham. He wrestled with Jacob. He appeared to uh, Joshua. Jehovah actually stood before Joshua. And he revealed himself in many ways in the Old Testament. And the way of salvation in the Old Testament is the same way it is today, given by the covenant to Abraham. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. Adam believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. So did Eve. So did Jacob. So did Joseph and Joshua. So no one at any time under any circumstances has ever been saved by keeping the Mosaic Law. Adam and Eve weren't saved by keeping the Mosaic Law. It didn't exist. Abraham was not saved by keeping the Mosaic Law. It did not exist. Not until 480 years after Abraham did the Mosaic Law even come into existence, and the Apostle Paul in Galatians is going to explain that. So the great issue with the believer is what? What's the great issue? Notice what it says in uh, Galatians 3.14. So that the blessing given to Abraham might come in Christ Jesus, so that we might once and for all receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what is received? Notice what it doesn't say. That the Gentiles, or that the promise is, the Gentiles might get rid of their bad habits and be better people. That's what they'll teach you in church teach you how to be better people and meet good friends who are good people. Not true. It doesn't say that they might get rid of their bad habits and become better people. It doesn't say that the Gentiles might once and for all keep a taboo and be great. It doesn't say that the Gentiles must stop drinking, smoking, and working on Sunday. None of that. None of that is mentioned. What does it say? So that we might once and for all receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the covenant given to Abraham and given to us. So the great issue with you as a believer is what? The filling of the Spirit. We've received the Spirit through faith. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the indwelling of the Spirit and we receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And when we sin, we lose the filling and so then we must name our sin to maintain the filling of the Spirit. And that's the issue and we know that. The great issue with the believer is, are you filled with the Spirit? That's the great issue. Not, are you keeping taboos? Not, are you doing this and doing that? But, are you filled with the Spirit? And Paul makes it very clear. And by the way, there are many unbelievers who keep many taboos much better than we can. Have you ever looked at an Arab Muslim and said to yourself, Wow, what a wonderful man that Arab Muslim is because he doesn't touch a drop of alcohol. That Arab Muslim man, he prays three times a day. And when they pray, they get down on their knees and bow toward Mecca. And they do it three times a day. In fact, those Arabs pray more than many Christians ever do. And do you ever say to yourself, Wow, I would really like to be a Muslim Arab. No, probably not. If you do, you're crazy. You don't want to go that way. Uh, yet they, they're working. They're working just as Jews work and just as believers who have already believed in Christ try to work for spirituality. They're no better than a Muslim when they get into that. No better. In fact, worse than. They are still enemies of the cross. You can believe in Christ and become an enemy of the cross by doing what? Going in for works. And just as the Arab Muslims are enemies of the cross, so are believers who go in for salvation by works and or spirituality by works. Now, the person who's saved, he's saved and good for him, but uh, he will receive no rewards. So some of the greatest taboo keepers are in other parts of the world, as are the Muslims and the Jews in other parts of the world. And we don't want to follow them. We look at the Muslim who uh, 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 prays toward Mecca three times a day. We, we look at him as a nut, and we should. And who else should we look as, as a nut? 
Well, I saw many of the Jews on the History Channel yesterday in Israel, and what, the, what were they doing? They were praying at the wall, and they were doing this. They looked retarded. They closed their eyes, bounced up and down at a wall. God didn't hear them. Yet they think that by even moving their head back and forth, they're getting through. That God is somehow impressed that they can move their neck. What if somebody's a paraplegic and can't move their neck? You see how stupid it is. Energy of the flesh. Because I move my neck, God will hear me greater. Or God will actually hear me better than he hears everyone else. This is how they think. This is how religion thinks, and that's why it's so evil. And so today, people look at Christianity and see a bunch of phony taboos. Unbelievers look at Christianity. Why is Christianity mocked so much on the Comedy Channel and HBO and all those things? And why is some of the things so hilarious? Because some of them are true. They look at Christianity and they see a lot of phoniness. They look at Christianity and they see people keeping taboos. And then they see them. And then they see a bunch of Baptists uh, trying to keep their taboos go to the liquor aisle or liquor store. You know, we have a lot of uh, churches in Anderson, but we also have a lot of liquor stores. That just doesn't add up, does it? Well, they're not keeping their own taboos, obviously. What do we have in Anderson? Probably 80%. Baptist, 80% believer even, maybe, and uh, yet uh, they're all going to liquor stores. Now, the taboo is don't do that, but they do it. I can guarantee you they'd be out of business if people didn't do that. And so the unbelieving world looks at that and says, you're a bunch of phony hypocrites. You act one way on Sunday and act another the rest of the week, and that's exactly what they do. And so the unbelieving world laughs at it and says, aha, I would never be a Christian. They're a bunch of phonies. That's not an excuse not to believe in Christ. Just because people believe in Christ and become phony, well, that's their problem. They need to not be so subjective. They need to be objective and say, I need to believe in Christ. And if there's unbelievers that want to do that, there's a church right here where they can get the gospel. So Galatians 3.15. Galatians 3.15 now. Brothers, that means believers. Brothers, I keep on speaking. Linear action, sir. I keep on speaking after the manner of men. Now, after the manner of men, this is a preparation of sta uh, a preposition of standard, a normal standard, and it means he keeps on speaking after human viewpoint, and he does so to make an application. He has to teach them on the level of human viewpoint to teach them to give them an application because they're not filled with the Spirit. So he has to keep on teaching them after the manner of men because they're not filled with the Spirit. He's got to shock them out of their carnality. Just as no one, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. So Paul is speaking from human viewpoint to give an illustration. Secondly, a man's covenant is an agreement between two members of the human race. It's a human contract. He's speaking here in human terms, and he's talking about a human contract. And in Paul's day, a contract is a contract. Now today, we can get a horde of lawyers on our side to change the contract. But in the olden days, during the days of Paul, a contract was a contract written in stone, and you couldn't change it. You couldn't add to it. You couldn't take away from it. It was a contract and it was binding. So Paul is speaking in human viewpoint saying, look, unbelievers make contracts. Unbelievers make covenants. And unbelievers keep their contracts and keep their covenants. So in Paul's day, this was very important. And even today, we have some contracts existing uh, in a written form that existed in those days. So we get three principles out of this. In Galatians 3.15, Paul is actually making three points. Point number one. There are three points out of Galatians 3.15 that Paul is making. Point number one. If an unbeliever will not alter a covenant or contract without permission, certainly a righteous God will not do so. If an unbeliever will keep a contract, certainly God's going to keep his, is what he's saying. If an unbeliever who hasn't even believed in Christ can keep a contract, certainly God in His sovereignty and righteousness and justice and fairness will keep a contract. So what contract are, is Paul talking about? He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant. 
And what did the Abrahamic covenant say? Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. And that's exactly what it means and that contract did not change. So then along after this comes the Mosaic Law some 430 years later after the... Uh, or actually, uh, four, yeah, 430 years later there will be the Mosaic Law. So by application... If there are two unsaved people who will make a contract and keep it, will not God keep it in his absolute righteousness? You better believe he will. If two unbelievers can keep the contract, God will keep his contract with us that when we believe in him, we're saved and we can't lose it. God keeps his contract. So anyone who believes that they can lose their salvation then they think less of God than they do infidels. Again, you might want to write this point down because many people think they can lose their salvation and when they think that, like that, they're in a state of blasphemy and they lower God to a level of an unbeliever. Anyone who believes they can lose their salvation, then they think less of God than they do the infidels. What's infidel mean? Unbeliever. That's what Muslims call us, but they're the infidel. They don't believe in Christ. An infidel is anyone who doesn't believe in Christ. And if people who don't believe in Christ can keep a covenant, and then you say, I can lose my salvation, you're saying that God is less than an unbeliever, and he can't even keep a covenant that he made with us, that he made in the Abrahamic covenant even. The second principle out of this, Judaizers came into... Galatia, and they claimed some divine authority. But what did they do when they came to Galatia? They added to the contract of the Mosaic, they added to the Abrahamic contract by adding the Mosaic law as a means for salvation. By doing so, what they're doing is imputing to God unrighteousness. They're saying, God, you're just like an unbeliever and you don't keep your first covenant. First covenant, Abrahamic covenant. Believe in the Lord and you'll be saved. So because God would then add to his own covenant, and that means he's doing something unbelievers wouldn't even do, and that's to add to a contract. So what Paul is telling them is, look, Galatians, you've added to a contract. You were under the Abrahamic covenant, believe, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Then you added to it. And then you said, well... Only way I can be saved is to get circumcised. Only way I can be saved is to follow the Mosaic law. And by doing so, they fell into blasphemy and they called God an unbeliever. They were calling him unrighteous. What they were saying is God welshes on his word. He made the word known to Abraham, but he's welshed on that now and now we've got to follow the law. See, Abraham wasn't under the law. Abraham simply believed for salvation. Now the Galatians say, nope, nope, we've got to add something to it because these people told us they were from God and they told us we need to add stuff to it like circumcision and following the law. And so Paul throws it right back at him and says, look, unbelievers don't add to a contract. Do you think God's adding to the contract? And that really threw them off guard because they're in total blasphemy and the Galatians are being totally blasphemous Therefore, I cheer Paul when he calls them stupid, 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 stupid Galatians. I cheer him on when I read that. You should too, because it was the only way that would shock them out of what they believed. And they started going in for the Galatians, and any time legalists start to rear their ugly heads, it's time for a verbal bashing from the pastor. You've got to do it. So then the third principle out of it, third principle from Galatians 3.15 the Abrahamic covenant is still in force because it's an unconditional covenant the Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant it's still in effect and part of the Abrahamic covenant was Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account another part of it was that Jesus Christ would be his seed and he was most of the covenants been fulfilled. The other covenant is the millennial covenant in which uh, Abraham will receive all of that land, and he will. Now, most of the covenants already be, been fulfilled, so if you doubt the last part of it, there's something wrong with you. 
If you doubt the Israelites are going to get their land in the millennium, something wrong. He's already fulfilled most of it, and believe me, he'll fulfill the latter part that hasn't occurred yet. And in fact, the Bible talks about the millennium as if, as if it's already happened. It talks about the tribulation as if it has already happened. Because when God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's as if it already has. So don't doubt it. And don't doubt that there's going to be a resurrection. And don't doubt that afterwards there'll be a tribulation. And don't doubt that you'll be evaluated. And don't doubt that there'll be a millennium. All of these things will come to pass. Most of the Abrahamic covenants already come to pass. So the Abrahamic covenant is still in force. It's an unconditional covenant. And an unconditional covenant can never be voided. An unconditional covenant depends solely on the character of God not upon human ability. An unconditional covenant depends upon the character of God and not human ability. What does the Mosaic Law depend upon? Well, you see, the Mosaic Law is a conditional covenant. If you do this, you will be blessed. What's part of the Mosaic Law? Children, obey your parents, and you will live a long life. And it applies today. That has carried over into the church age. If you children obey your parents, you will live a long life. A promise. But it's conditional. It's conditional upon whether you obey your parents or not. If you do not obey your parents, you'll probably die young. Probably. Not in every case, but you'll probably die young if you do not obey your parents. And believe it. It's part of a promise. But it's a conditional covenant. It depends on your actions. But the unconditional covenant depends on God's action only. So salvation is unconditional and depends on the action of Christ. Now as we move from 3.15 to 3.16, Galatians 3.16 is actually parenthetical. That means there's a parenthesis here. I don't know if they put a parenthesis in your Bible, but they should have. Galatians 3.16 is a parenthesis. Paul is going to go off subject for a second and then move straight to 3.17. And I'll read you 3.15 and then 3.17 to show you that it flows together. And then 3.16 is an aberration for a second. Therefore, 3.16 should be in parenthesis. And if you've ever been to school, you know what parentheses are for. You're saying something that's a bit off subject but still relevant. Galatians 3.15, Brothers, I keep on speaking after the manner of men, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. And then 3.17, what I mean is this. The law, which is conditional, introduced three, 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant, that's the unconditional covenant of Abraham, previously established under the authority of God, and thus do away with the promise. So Galatians 3.15 and 3.17 follow the subject. Galatians 3.16 goes away from it for a moment. So Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds. That means, what does that mean? And to his seed. And why does it have seed singular and seed plural? Well, there's two different reasons. First reason is the seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, and it's singular. Jesus Christ is singular. But there's another meaning to it. We are in Christ. We are Abraham's seed and we are in Christ. And since we're in union with Christ, we're part of that singular noun there. We're part of the seed. We are part of the seed of Abraham because we believed in Christ. And that's actually what it's getting to. So that's why the scripture does not say, and to seeds. That means you do not have the promise. Uh, if you have been physically born of Abraham, you don't have the promise is what it means. And if you were to use seeds in the plural, it would refer to all the children of Abraham. Great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren. It would mean by physical birth you're saved, but that's not what it means. And the Jews believed that. They said, well, since we are children of Abraham, we're saved. But they thought of it as, well, you were physically born by Abraham or from Abraham's lineage, therefore you're saved, and that's incorrect. Nobody's saved because of their physical birth. We're all condemned at birth. So this is why it says this. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning the physical birth. 
meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Again, we're in union with Christ, so that includes us. When you believe in Christ, you become a child of Abraham, an adult son as we've noted. And we noted the two different forms, weos and um, token. Token. I forgot the Greek word for that one, but uh, we had weos and then the other Greek word referring to the physical. I know it starts with a T. Technos. T-E-K-N-O-S. Technos refers to physical birth. Weos refers to the uh, birth of regeneration. And so you're not saved by technos, physical birth from Abraham. You're saved by becoming an adult child, weos. We went through that earlier. So now Galatians 3.17. What I mean is this. The law, and this is referring to the law of Moses, which is conditional. What I mean is this. The law, introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant. What covenant? The unconditional covenant of Abraham, faith alone in Christ alone. So the fact that the Mosaic law came along doesn't mean that it sets aside the unconditional covenant. You cannot set aside an unconditional covenant. You can set aside a conditional one, and it's been set aside for our time. You cannot set aside an unconditional covenant. Previously established under the authority of God. You might have by God. It actually means under the authority of God. Previously established under the authority of God and thus do away with the promise. So principles out of this. The promise of faith alone in Christ alone has not been set aside by the Mosaic law. It has not been abrogated. It has not been done away with simply because a conditional law for Israel came along. Just because the Mosaic law came along, which was a conditional law for Israel only, just because that came along, it did not abrogate or do away with the unconditional covenant given to Abraham. Meaning, why are you Galatians saying that you must follow a conditional law when you know that you were saved by an unconditional law, faith alone in Christ alone? It's very logical. And Galatians is very logical. And it just shows how strong stupid legalism is and it shows why he called the Galatians stupid because this is just logical it just makes perfect sense yet legalism makes no sense whatsoever so actually Paul in Galatians is acting as a lawyer and doing a very good job if I wanted anyone to represent me as a lawyer it would be Paul he was good at it and he is acting as a lawyer in this case and he has really destroyed what the Galatians have been up to. And uh, a way to put it is this. We have a law in the United States, the law, of la- the law of the land. Do you know what the law of the land in the United States is? It's called the Constitution. The Constitution is our law of the land. And that sets precedence. And we have the Second Amendment of the Constitution. You can bear arms. That is, you can own a gun if you want to. That's part of our freedom. Now, let's say Congress comes along and says, I'm going to take away your guns. In fact, everybody tomorrow, line up with all the guns that you have, and that would clean out Zach's bedroom. Line up with all the guns that you have and give them to me. You don't, uh, and then you could say, but the, the Constitution, the law of the land says, I have a right to own these, and you do and nothing comes in front of the Constitution. Nothing. Yet they try all the time. They try all the time and we're losing our freedom because of it. But the Constitution is our law and it is an unconditional law. And if they were to tell me to give up my guns, they'd have to pull it from my cold, dead hands because I'm in the United States and I know we have a law called the Constitution and that's the law I will follow, the law of the land. And so by, so the, the way you can understand it, it's as if uh, you have been following the unconditional law of the Constitution and then somebody comes along with another law and you just give it all up. No, that's not the way it should be. And that's not the way it should be in this case. And uh, I'll give you a better analogy later. But now let's look at Romans 9.30 as part of it. Romans 9.30. 
Romans 9.30 will give an explanation of a lot of what we've been noting. And it's going to note something that happened to the Israelites. Something very interesting. Romans 9.30 What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness what righteousness? The righteousness of the Mosaic Law. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, excuse me, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. And then Romans 9.31, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, Israel, when they got the Mosaic Law, they started acting like the Mosaic Law was the unconditional covenant, and that was the means of salvation. As we've noted, the Mosaic Law can do nothing but curse us. So what started to happen was the Israelites would start following the law and Gentiles would come along and say, well, I'll just believe. And as a result, there were actually more Gentile believers during the age of Israel. Even during the age of Israel, there were more Gentile believers because Israel went in for their law. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. They followed it, but they couldn't attain it. Romans 9.32 Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ. They would not have faith alone in Christ. They thought they could work themselves into salvation by following the law. So what this describes is the fact that many Israelites rejected Jesus Christ and strove for the law. It's as if the Israelites had been given a filet mignon called grace, and they were. They were still under the unconditional covenant. They were still under grace, and they were given the filet mignon, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. But it was as if they sat down at the table and saw faith alone and Christ alone, filet mignon, and said, I don't want it. And they threw it out, and they decided to eat some peas instead, the Mosaic Law. And so what happened is they threw this uh, filet mignon out. The Gentiles came along and ate it up. Said, I like that. It looks a lot better than that, those peas they're eating. And, and so you, it's as if uh, they're sitting there at out back and they bring out a filet mignon medium and they just throw it out. They'd rather have peas at home. Or another way is uh, to think of it is uh, God's given them a Cadillac Escalade, but they want to drive their Ford Taurus. And do they want to go in for the law? And so the Gentiles come along and say, well, you've disregarded the Cadillac Escalade. I'll take it. You don't want the stake? You don't want the Cadillac? I'll take the stake and the Cadillac. And that's exactly how it occurred. And that's why Israel went under the fifth cycle of discipline. They rejected the gospel of Christ. They would have rather stuck with the Mosaic Law. And when you stick with the Mosaic Law, the only thing that can happen to you is cursing. And that's exactly what happened to Israel. And they were accursed. And as a result, they went under the fifth cycle of discipline. And if the majority of Christians continue, well, there always will be a majority. But if we don't get a pivot of mature believers who start to live by grace, this country will suffer the same fate. Our country will be punished faster for not following grace than for raising hell. And we do both. We'll be punished for both. And it's just a, it's a shame what's going on. And there, we will be attacked eventually. And if not attacked, something, we're going to be punished collectively. There's no way around it. No way around it because no one cares. Now back to Galatians 3.18. Galatians 3.18. Galatians 3.18. For if... Now, this is important. It's a first-class condition of assumption. For if. First-class condition of assumption. It, it means uh, Paul is assuming something for the sake of argument. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God, this is middle voice in the Greek, this means God gave this on the basis of his own character. But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Now, if you want to know what he's really saying, I didn't give you the elliptical form. This is how Paul actually says it. 
If the inheritance of the law, no, no more promise. He just throws out all those verbs. He's being elliptical. And I guess we could understand that. You get upset, you start leaving out verbs. You just start shouting. And this is what Paul said. If the inheritance of the law, no more promise. It's a way of chewing out by words. See, he's not looking at the Galatians face to face. He's writing this letter. Now, he did chew out Peter face to face and wrote about it. Not only did Peter get chewed out face to face, but then Paul wrote about it. And every time Peter picked up Galatians, he could get chewed out again. Funny. But Peter still liked him. Humility. Humility. If I wrote about you, and I would never do it, of course. It's not the same today. But if I wrote about you and put it in the paper, you would be very mad, and you should be. But here's Paul, and it's in divine record forever. Forever. <laughs> That's funny. Peter got chewed out forever on divine record. For if, first class condition of assumption. And then, uh, so the only way God can be glorified is by giving us something, and that's what it means in middle voice. But God, middle voice, gave it on the basis of his own character is what it means. And the only way God is glorified is when he can give us something. God can never be glorified if he had to bless us by our works because we don't have the character. We don't have the ability to reach God's character. And we must note some of God's character. God is sovereign. God is righteousness, justice, love, immutu immutability, veracity, eternal life, omnipotence, omnipresence. Uh, and God gave the Abrahamic covenant, which is justification by faith. And that means it all depends upon God, and he gave it to us without strings attached. By application, how many times have you given somebody something thinking they need to pay you in return? If you're going to give somebody something, it's without strings. And you don't expect to do that to, for them to do this, that, or the other just because you give them something. One time with uh, my pastor, some man walked up with a million bucks and said, I'll give you a million bucks and you teach this way. He gave him back the million bucks. No way. You don't give with strings attached. And, uh, and that's the way you should give, and that's the way God gives, without strings attached. How many times have you heard somebody say to you, uh, maybe you've treated them wrong in some way, or they think you have, and they've said to you, after all I've done for you, you're going to treat me this way after all I've done for you. We probably all said it. I said it when I was younger, I'm sure, copying many of my relatives. Not many, some of them won't tell you who, but some people would talk like that, and children copy stuff like that. After all I've done for you, you're going to do this? It is childish. So, that's the application of that. But God's given us salvation because it reflects his character. And if we had to work for it, it would not reflect his character because we cannot attain the character of God. Now, tomorrow we will get uh, back to Matthew 19:16, which deals again with the, uh, with the rich young ruler. And I know we went over it before. Some of you may not have been here, but we did go over it before. But I got some new information on it, so we're going to go over it again. And uh, that is the rich young ruler, and then we'll continue with Galatians. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen.